Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on today's Warrior Chat. I'm Wayne McCullough. Our topic today is about safe computing, and I think it's very, very important for you at home, whether you have children or do not have children, because we're gonna cover topics such as how you can safeguard your computer at home. And I know it's important because I mentioned, you know, I have a mother at home who has a computer, and every now and then, you know, things get messed up and there's viruses that get entered into the computer. Uh, so we're gonna talk to you about how you can protect your computer today, but also, particularly if you have children, young people around, and maybe even things that you don't wanna pop up on your computer, what can you do to make sure that only appropriate content is displayed on your computer. There's some of the topics we're gonna to cover on today's Warrior Chat, so gosh, it's nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. With me right now is Mr. Bruce Mickey. Uh, Mr. Mickey is our coordinator of technology here at the Southern York County School District and is an expert in the field of technology. So Mr. Mickey, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, let's talk first. Uh, when you talk about safeguarding your computer, give us an idea of why it's important, what's happening out there. Uh, in general, the safeguarding your computer is essentially protecting the asset, the computer itself, so uh, it can keep peak performance, keep an operational state, as well as the material that's stored on it, your documents, some precious photos uh, that we take over time. Yeah. Um, so safeguarding the computer is essentially preserving the asset. So let's talk about the four key elements to safeguarding your computer. First. Uh, there's over 70,000 currently, 70,000 uh, programs maliciously attack intended to target your computer daily. Hmm. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, so the key principle to defend yourself from malware is antivirus and anti-spyware security. Um, malware gets to your computer through security holes within the operating system or third-party software. Uh, most of them install themselves with you not knowing it. And then once installed on your computer, they can infect other computers without your knowledge because they are seeking the internet, tracking your activity, potentially sharing identity information if you're not careful on what sites you visit. These are all the different harmful uh, measures of anti-spyware. So once getting the uh, antivirus and anti-spyware installed on your computer, just make sure that the automatic updates are installed and your subscription service to your antivirus doesn't terminate. Okay, I've heard the term firewall. Um, again, if I'm at home, what can I do to my computer to protect it from stuff coming in like you talked about? Yeah, the, the term firewall can, can lead you to wonder what it really means. It's, it's certainly not a heat element. Right. But think of it as a barrier where it prevents unwanted traffic, network traffic from accessing your computer. Network access, access can come in the form of malicious programs like malware I just described, or it could come in the form of a hacker, an individual trying to gain access to your computer. A firewall can come in one of two forms, software or hardware. The easiest ways that one would identify it is the hardware firewall could be thought of as your uh, wireless router. It's a piece of equipment between you and your computer and the outside network where it's going to prevent certain activity from penetrating your computer. Yeah. And a software firewall, think of it as what's in the operating system, generally found in the, in the uh, con control panel yeah. to which you can enable. Okay. The uh, two things so far I think are important as we kind of go through and recap. Anti-software, make sure it's updated. Antivirus. Antivirus anti software. Some of it comes loaded when you buy your computer already, but it does. I've seen it on my computer pop up saying it's time to update your software, or even if you buy it and load it in, you get messages sometimes it's time to update it. Uh, I guess that's one option, but there's also web-based options available. Uh, the antivirus is security software. Think of it as that, okay. to keep it updated. Get it installed, get the real-time protection on your computer, and keep it updated. Okay, so. Now I talked about how the malware attacks your computer through security holes. Security holes that the intended attackers find within your operating system, within your browser, okay. third-party software that may be running on your computer. So as the vendors who manufacture the operating system, the third-party software, or things where security holes present openings for malware to get to your computer, are always constantly producing patches and fixes to address these holes. Right. So it's important to turn on the automatic updates 
of your operating system and third-party software so it knows that when these fax fixes and patches are produced to download them and install them and put them in place automatically for you. Think of it as hassle-free security. Okay, how do I know if my antivirus software, and we'll, we'll take each one here one at a time, is up to date? How do I know that? Well, you could launch your antivirus software. Real-time antivirus software will have an icon appear in your taskbar. Okay. Okay, so you'll know it's running. If it's outdated, expired, or out of date, typically there'll be an X or some warning. But if you're unsure, you can just double click it to bring it up to see the settings. And in the settings, you can see how to schedule the scan, an automatic computer scan, when it occurs and you want that occur at night. It'll show you the automatic updates, whether they're turned on or not, the last time the updates were run, how current they are. So all of the antivirus computer settings are there and all you gotta do is bring it up from the taskbar to see it. And the other thing you mentioned is make sure your software that you're using you're allowing automatic updates. So for example, Microsoft will provide automatic updates that will protect their software. How do I make sure that happens? In the, in the control panel of the computer is uh, an icon okay. called Windows Updates. Okay. And you open it up and it'll be three different choices that you can say automatically download and install when they're available. You could have another option that says download and notify me when they're available so I can install them. Okay, interesting. Uh, I did have one time, my computer crashed. Uh, in fact, this happened with my daughter recently, lost everything she had. Pictures, uh, you know, baby pictures for the last year and everything else is really very really important. Uh, how can you prevent that? Well, as you say, no, ha no matter how proactive you are with antivirus, security preventions using firewall, and you're doing everything right, it's not if but when a computer becomes inoperable. Whether it starts to go slow, or in fact it just comes plain out in opera. It could be a disk crash, it could be a hardware failure, but ultimately a computer can become inoperable and the safe and single source recovery is that of your best backup. So it's very important for you to have chosen a strategy that fits your individual um, level of expertise as well as uh, your needs. So the choices may be a full disk image, it may be that of a data backup, and then for the easiest of configurations for backup would be that of online backup. A full disk image is taking complete uh, image of everything on your computer so that when it does become inoperable, you're restoring it back to a point of operations yeah. where you last took the image. Uh, that's essentially the best, although it takes a lot of media, it takes a lot of backup storage to do those on a regular basis. So the next would be just preserving data, that of your documents, that of your pictures, things that change more often, so that when the machine becomes inoperable, you would just restore the operating system from a restore CD typically available by the vendor you purchased it. And then after that, just bring back your data, yeah. either from the online backup or the local backup. But the most important part of that is, make sure that when you're doing backup, it finishes and it's complete. And secondly, practice restoring. Go through the process of recovery when you don't need it, so you're prepared when you do. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I went to Walmart, bought a you know a, a storage unit, a little uh, case, and just plug it into the USB drive and hit back, you know, uh, and it backs everything up. That's correct. And it takes 20 minutes. Now, I guess there's also online options now, so you don't even have to go buy your equipment. It is, and another uh, benefit of an online storage is now you're not susceptible to uh, robbery, you're not susceptible to fire, accidents in the home. Right. Because now that's off-site, out of your uh, home. So that's another benefit to online backup. Yeah, the, uh, I wanna make everyone know here at home, uh, all this information plus more detail is found on the school district's website, www.syc. Uh, sd.org and you go to a link, quick link, safe computing. Yes. And uh, this information and more for this, for this warrior chat is available there. Uh, and it also has on that site, we'll give you some good links to get additional information because in our time today, we're just gonna be able to give you some basics. Uh, in order in the, for you. Uh, excuse me, Mike. Yeah. In the uh, safe computing PowerPoint, the one I just covering right now, at the end of that PowerPoint, you'll see a URL 
as well as the page to the site called Stay, StaySafeOnline.org. It's the National Security Alliance, okay. where it has links to find antivirus, and, uh, software firewall, content filtering, another subject that I'll be covering here shortly, yeah. and other things. Yeah. Uh, Bruce mentioned content filtering. This is particularly important if you have children at home. Uh, you know, I, I, for example, have uh, a daughter at home, and I want to be able to regulate uh, what is accessible and uh, on the computer, just like I would on TV uh, and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about what that would be referred to as content filtering, if you don't mind, describe it to us. Right. You did a good job there yourself. I think, to ask, I think I can describe it in one more element as we compared to TV. Uh, it's parental control. Setting parental controls of what you want your child to be able to view or restrict them from things you don't want them to view. Okay. Uh, to, avoid, not <laughs> to avoid the technology term I'm not, it's called proxy. But instead of thinking proxy, think of the term nanny. You know, think of nanny because what you're going to do is essentially set a virtual nanny to oversee and monitor all of what your child is attempting to access, preventing them from access. Uh, so the internet has got a vast variety of knowledge for children. But one also must remember it has a vast amount of material of ob objectionable content. Right. So we can, through a um, content filter, install the nanny on the computer and make the settings such that we prohibit our children from seeing particular categories of content. Categories are broken down by these software applications into categories of social media, pornography, uh, crime, hate crime, racism. You'll see them all broken out. And the great thing about these products is that they do real-time categorization. So as new websites get put on the internet daily, this software is out there recognizing them and categorizing them so that the settings in your content filter are real time finding sites that it's automatically going to block your child from, from um, accessing. The other thing th people think about uh, when configuring a content filter is setting up a safe search. So while we've set the sites up from restrictive access, a search for folks that are not familiar is a way in which you can send a word or a phrase out to the internet and it will respond with all the various websites that have material on that word or that phrase. So the response may have information into sites that you've got set up to block, but you don't want to tour your, yeah. tour your child into seeing this information because a curious mind somehow ultimately finds that material somewhere. Um, so safe search is something you want to enable in your content filter and another key thing is you can set up uh, times of day that you'll make those sites available or even the internet. You can, you can shut the internet down through your content filter. And then lastly, it has reports so that while you're not there looking over the shoulder watching, you have reports available that, to you that has historical information about sites they visited and what they keyed while they were on that site to see their activity. Uh, I'm highly motivated. Where do I find a content filter to install? Okay, on the um, PowerPoint under content filtering on our district website, I have four links to very good parental content filter applications. Okay, good, good. All right, thank you. We're gonna take a very short break and then we're gonna come back and talk about citizenship digital citizenship, but nonetheless citizenship as we uh, work on social media sites or other computer use. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much, Mr. Mickey, Thank our you. coordinator of technology here at Southern York County School District. We're very fortunate to have a, a gentleman of your expertise working here, so thank you very thank much. You. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. The odds of a child being in a Broadway show are 1 in 11,000. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, 1 in 166. The odds say it's time to listen. To learn the signs of autism, visit AutismSpeaks.org. 
Welcome back to Warrior Chat. Gosh, I'm happy you're with us. Uh, we're talking about safe computing today here on Warrior TV. With me right now is Mr. Ben Louie, who is our technology integration specialist. And that's a mouthful, but here's what it means, is we have lots of technology here at the schools. Computers is just part of that. Uh, smart boards and iPods and iPads. lots of different technology, iPads. And what Ben does is directly work with our faculty so they are using that technology in the classroom in a way that enhances uh, the educational success of our children and does just a great job. So thank you very much, Thanks, Wayne. Mr. Louis, for all you do. Digital citizenship. Well, gosh, when I think of citizenship, I'm thinking of good old-fashioned values that I was taught mm -hmm. when I was a boy growing up in Glen Rock, and that is how we treat each other, uh, how I take care of my, you know, be active in the community and, and so forth. Uh, what does digital citizenship mean? Well, digital citizenship is, is really the same types of things, uh, except for it's, it's how do we, how we act, how we interact with people, what do we do in an online environment. And, yeah. um, you know, really the reason we need to talk about that is because a lot of times I think people in general, but especially younger people and students, uh, they they might have certain values that they would use in in what we would call the traditional or you know the real world, and they kind of don't they don't necessarily always transfer or translate those into the online or digital environment, and that can cause a lot of a lot of problems. So, you know, the, the term really refers to you know what's appropriate and how do you act when you're online. Yeah, I think you're right because. Uh uh, you know, uh, you were taught this way too, just because I know you, but we were taught to somebody who was older than us. We say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Uh, you talk politely. And then you see stuff that's written on the computer. It's, it's, it's first of all, it's just abbreviated. It's mm -hmm. sometimes no greeting. You know, when, you, when right. we wrote, when we were taught in class to write a traditional letter, you always said, dear so-and-so, you wrote the traditional letter. And online writing is, is not like uh, that. Yeah, that, that's definitely that's definitely one element. But I think yeah. even even you know more than that, you know, when you wrote, let's say you know you back in school you wrote a note about somebody or to someone, yeah. you know, occasionally you know it got to the wrong hands and got passed around and read by a few people. But let's say you do that same kind of thing now in an online social network or something like that, yeah. and before you know it, like thousands of people could have read that, you know, and it could be embarrassing to you or to someone else, you know, and, yeah. and social networks and, and things like Facebook are, are growing, you know, just exponentially. I mean, over four, you know, 400, 000, 400 million new Facebook members just since last year worldwide. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just hard to even comprehend. It is. The, uh, again, I have a middle school age daughter, uh, but I know dozens and dozens of text messages to her, mm -hmm. you know, her friends. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the average teen, yeah. you know, sends somewhere between three and 4,000 text messages a month, um, yeah. you know, and what they're sending there and what they're saying, you know, sometimes is, is you know, maybe not appropriate. And, you know, there's a large number of, of kids who, who um, when interviewed, have have mentioned that they felt they've been bullied in one way or another yeah. via, you know, a text message or some type of online social network, um, you know. And then the other thing is a lot of people have heard about is this this term called sexting, which is really, you know, inappropriate um, sexual type communication that's being, you know, transmitted via phone and, and internet. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, and again, as a parent, the real concern is. Uh, not number one, what is my child doing? Uh, but number two, what is the potentials to harm my mm -hmm. child also? Uh, so what can I do as a parent? Yeah, well, I think, you, you know, you need to understand probably two things, and that's the type of information that's being transmitted, and I think also, you know, the devices that are being used to trans transmit that. Uh, you know, um, in, in social network type sites like Facebook, you know, when you create your profile, you put certain personal information in there. And, and you know, depending on what you want people to know, you need to know what you enter in there and, and how you secure it. And there's different mm -hmm. places you can go to, to control that type of thing. Um, and also with, you know, with a lot of the new devices that are being used, which I'll get to in a minute, but they have GPS built into them. So uh, when you're, you know, saying, hey, I'm over at, you know, my friend Jimmy's house, if I have a GPS device that I, in my phone or whatever that I use to, to put that status update, it's also tagging my location if I have location services <laughs> turned on. And so, so I'm, I'm not only just saying things, I'm actually giving up information about myself and where I am. And so 
Yeah. It's important to, to realize the amount of things that are being communicated. Yeah, the one thing until I was chatting with you uh, a couple days ago that never just dawned on my wife and I is we have, you know, my daughter has a laptop computer and we make sure that's in a public room, mm -hmm. you know, it's in our living room. So, you know, we're walking by and we're noticing what's going on, but never once thought about the iPod or the cell phone, smartphone that, right. you know, that's, that might be communicating those kind of things also. Yeah, and that, that's the important thing to remember. You know, you might have, think you have your computer in a safe place, but you know, if your child happens to have a cell phone or an iPod or something like that, and they have it in their bedroom and you have wireless in your house, you know, really what they're, they're, they're online um, all the time without you really knowing about it. And, and I, I would just want to mention one other thing that, yeah. that newer device, not, that's not really a new device, but maybe people don't realize is a lot of the game systems now, like I know the Nintendo Wii um, and a lot of new TVs actually have web browsers and internet capability, uh, you know, connected right in there. So in addition to checking, you know, a phone and a computer, you really need to be monitoring the use on, on the gaming yeah. system, um, you know, and, yeah. and even on your TV if it happens to have a web browser built in. Well, I know a lot of you are like me. I can't even program my daggone VCR <laughs> uh, without my children helping me. Uh, so it's hard to imagine how do they do this stuff? How do, how do they just grow up knowing how to right. do this stuff? But well, they do. That's just the difference. You know, yeah. um, you know they've had those devices in their hands and, and have had access to them from a very early age. So, you know, you're sitting there trying to read the manual. They're just messing around with it and figuring it out. It's just a yeah. difference in, in the way they, their brain um, yeah. actually processes things and what they're able to do. Oh, it's amazing. I remember my son was a middle school child at the age. Our first computer, something happened to it. And uh, so I come home from school. He's got the computer technician on the mm -hmm. phone, uh, their help desk technician, and the computer's in all kind of pieces. He's got the screwdriver out. And, uh, you know, it's, it is amazing. Yeah. I mean, they, they just they, they think different than we do. Yeah, That's, you there's, know. there's no question. Okay. Obviously, the most uh, prevalent, probably, of these social networks is Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, give me some details of what I can do to make sure that that's not harming uh, my family, my daughter, and so forth. Right. Well, you know, there's a couple of things. Um, one is you probably, you know, if you don't have an account, you should probably get one, whether yeah. you plan to use it or not. Um, because, it, you know, if you, if you don't have an account, then you can't really follow up with what maybe she's doing. So that would be a good thing. And then also, you know, you can include her or have her conclude you um, in her network. Um, which now, when then, you say network, is that what they mean, friends? Yeah, like in okay. a friends list. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll be more specific and we'll talk just about Facebook then. So in Facebook, they're called friends. Okay. We have like a friends list or you friend someone on Facebook. It's kind of almost become like a verb now. Um, right. But anyway, yeah. So. So the first thing that you know you probably need to do is, is sit down with her and um, when you log into Facebook, uh, I think we have a slide that we can uh, put up here that actually shows a little bit, uh, if we can flip to it there. Yeah, so uh, when you log into Facebook in the top right corner there, there's a little triangular drop down arrow and you can click on that and there's two things that you can select there. You can select personal information, or uh, not personal information, uh, privacy settings, sorry it's hard to see, yep. and account settings. Um, and so in the privacy settings, you can set things such as, you know, who can interact with my, with, with my information? Um, you know, is my, is my information publicly searchable or is it only viewable amongst people that I have a friend relationship to? Uh, there's all kinds of settings in there that you should kind of go through and look at. Okay. Um, there's also some settings, you know, in Facebook, there's this thing called tagging. So let's say I take a picture, let's say I take a picture of you and me or someone takes a picture. I could upload that into Facebook and if you and I are friends on Facebook, I can upload that photo and say, hey, here's a picture, and I tag myself, that means that I'm showing that I'm in the picture and I could tag you. Well, you might not know about that. Um, so in that section there on you know, how tags work, you can say, don't allow other people to tag me in photos or notify me that I get tagged before it goes public, um, just things like that. So in that privacy settings, you can really go through and fine tune hmm. what you want people to be able to, to see and not see. And then in account settings, there's some security that you can set up uh, and there's a notifications area where you can go through there and you can basically say, you know, whenever this happens, whenever that happens, if somebody writes on my wall, which is like my, my page in Facebook, uh, I can have it set up that it sends me an email or even a text message saying, you know, hey, someone's just wrote on my wall. And it, it helps me as a Facebook user keep track of what's happening maybe without me knowing about it. Is it. Am I being simplistic by saying I'm not going to let my daughter or any of my children go to 
a house that I don't know that there's going to be par you know parental supervision mm -hmm. and it drives them nuts because I'm going to say okay who's going to be there you know our mm -hmm. parents going to be there I'm going to call the parents to make sure they're there right uh, but yet we almost let wide open communication and interaction yeah. happen on the internet am I wrong no, I mean you're not you know? wrong. I mean that that's that's the difficult area is trying to figure out how you know how we manage that, how much danger is there online yeah. versus you know um, you know in in the real world. Uh, and I think that's definitely why it's really important if if you have a Facebook account and you know, say your daughter is a friend of yours, every time she adds a new friend, you will be able to see that because that's how the network works. Yeah. She adds new people, you get a little message somewhere in Facebook that says, hey, you know blah 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 just added a new friend so it helps you kind of keep track of what's going there but I mean the main thing is, is periodically sit down and ask you know ask your daughter ask your son to log into Facebook sit down there with them say you know pull up your friend list let's go down through and, and you can randomly choose friends and you can look and see what type of things those people are saying you know and if you feel that that's not someone that you know you want to have your, your child interacting with then you can ask them to you know remove that person or you can even go as far as blocking that person so that they, they have no ability to interact with you. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the same kind of things that you do in, in, you know, real life, you almost need to start doing online, you know, especially with younger kids. And, you know, until they learn, yeah. until you, you have time to start developing some digital citizenship skills with them. No, you, know, you don't want to just let them out there on their own. Right. No, thank you. The, uh, and the same thing would be with the iPods and the mm -hmm. cell phones. Uh, check yeah. what's going on yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can really, you know, be too careful. Um, you know, you hate to be running around checking up, checking up on on kids, but you know, you know, we kind of owe that to them. I mean, they're still they're still our children. They still maybe don't have the ability to to make the right decisions, nor you know, are they ready to accept those consequences? Maybe so. Yeah, periodically ask them for their cell phone. I mean, it's, especially if you're paying for it, you know, say right. I want to just look and, and go through and see, you know, what kind of things are on your phone, what's in the browser history of the phone, what kind of messages have been sent, um, you know, and the same thing, same thing online. You know, if they have their own laptop, you know, periodically take a look at it. You know, you just I think just and not that you're trying to, you know, necessarily be the, you know, uh, I don't know the guy tracking them down but I think I don't mind have, being that I don't but mind I, I think yeah. not to look at it that way but to look at it as you know what like I care about right. what's going on and you know and helping them learn not necessarily just tracking down afterwards but being more proactive yeah, yeah. can you see me with a Facebook account <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start looking for you all right you convinced me it's important to do but <laughs> I, you're making I think me nervous you have a Facebook account and I think everyone out here in the audience should find you yeah I don't know you're making me nervous <laughs> all right well sounds good so mr. Ben Louis is as we talk about digital citizenship gosh it is it makes sense you know we we, we grew up talking citizenship but it's a whole it's a whole different ballgame right out there and, and the problem is a lot of people you know well, not to make you sound old, but a lot All of people right. from your generation who maybe don't embrace that yeah. don't realize the importance of really having those types of conversations with your kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. you think, well, it's not important to me, but but it is important to your kids, and you know, right? You can't just take it away. I think we need to. It's not going to go away, so we need to start teaching them how to how to use it and how to use it appropriately. Oh, well, you make a good point. Teach them how to be responsible with right. it because just. Because you're right, they're going to have access to it. Uh, right. You know, so. well, they might not have it now, but you, you want them. You want their first access to be when they're 19 years old, and not really right. have any idea how to how to act responsibly. It's probably better to, to start earlier. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Ben Louie, our technology integration specialist. Thank you for all you do uh, for our school district. I appreciate it very much. Right. Thank uh, you, Wayne. The uh, we're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about cyber threats with Mr. Mark Rill. Hope you're having a good time. Again, all this information can be found at www.sycsd.org, and there's a quick link for safe computing. And uh, I think you'd be interested to go there, and uh, because it also there are some links included in the presentations that can direct you to additional information. It is a very, very important topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Thank you. May I have your attention, please? Would the owner of the spare tire, <laughs> slightly hairy, uh, with a little brown mold to the left of the belly button, it's an any, please report to the press box and retrieve your appendage. Oh, they must have lost this parking further away from the stadium and walking in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're back to the action.
Welcome back to our discussion on safe computing here on Warrior Chat. I'm Wayne McCullough. I'm happy you're with us because, uh, gosh, I can't think of a more relevant topic than how to have safe computing in our homes uh, with our children. And you know, I, you know, I have three generations within a small area in Glenrock, and all generations are involved in making sure uh, their computers are safeguarded and to make sure children have appropriate access and safeguards in place uh, as they access computer. But there's certainly one topic that impacts us all, and that is the threats of all kinds of craziness happening just because we access this worldwide network, the internet. And with us to talk about that is Mr. Mark Rill, who's our coordinator of marketing and public information here at the Southern York County School District. So thank you, Mr. Rill. Thanks. Um, first of all, thank you for all you do for the school district. I appreciate it very much. Mark, in addition to his role uh, in marketing and public information, uh, is actively involved in uh, our alumni association, also works in our school district's committee as it relates to the Southern York County School District Foundation, uh, and is a graduate of Susquehannock, so has a, a strong affection uh, for the school district, I know, but also uh, has taken that affection and actively taken a very important role in the life of the school district, so thank you. Thanks. Uh, when you talk about threats, give us some examples of things that can happen and how they happen, please. Yeah, when you think about uh, you know, cyber threats, one of the first things that you think of is identity theft. Okay. And in the past three years, there have been nearly 30 million incidences of identity theft which is it's coming down but some of the ways that we can help uh, you know help our audience help our school district avoid identity theft is number one to avoid phishing and you're, you're looking at me probably like what is phishing yeah. and phishing is uh, defined as when individuals pretend to be financial institutions or other entities and try and get your personal information uh, mostly it happens through email and I'm sure you know you've probably gotten an email from Africa, yeah. from an African leader trying to launder money, or one of those uh, types of schemes. Or ask for a donation of five thousand dollars or something. Mm -hmm. My my father-in-law, who is 83 years old, actually this past summer responded to one of those, and money was automatically taken out of bank accounts. And you wonder how, how can that how can they how can that happen? Yeah, it, it, it is interesting, and you know, one of the ways also that of the way that they uh, gain your financial information or bill you for services is through online sweepstakes and um, hmm. uh, surveys. When you fill those out, a lot of times you'll, you'll see a 5 or $10 charge on your phone bill. So you'll actually get a monthly bill every month, and trying to remove those is, is quite a pain. Yeah. So. Two things as it relates to email. One is, I think which makes common sense, uh, but daggone it's tempting sometimes you get an email from someone or something that you don't know. You know, you can't identify uh, the person and should you open that email? Should you not, if you open it, does it cause a problem just by opening it? Um, as long as you have a, uh, a good uh, antivirus program, any spyro program, as Mr. Mickey mentioned, you know, you should be okay to open emails. But okay. I would avoid opening emails um, that are from someone that you don't know or especially if you know if the subject is if the subject of the email is is something off the wall, right. it's probably spam. Well, and the second thing would be, but even friends send you video clips of whatever they think you might be interested in, uh, and I always worry about opening them. Also, should I be? Well, that goes back to your uh, antivirus, anti-spyware program. Okay. You know, hopefully, if you do open it, it will catch it. But um, the other aspect of that too is that. There are a lot of viruses that spread themselves via email, and right. they, you know, they say, "Oh, click here to look at this funny video." Or so right. you want to really scrutinize the email before you click that link and say, "Did somebody actually type this, or does it look more like a, a robot?" Yeah, and I think uh, you mentioned uh, making sure your computer is secure with antivirus. M Mr. Mickey talked about that also, but also things have changed. Where even an old guy like me, uh, I'm doing all of my banking. Uh, most of my bill paying and even just because I hate going to stores I'm even doing most of my shopping uh, online what can I do to protect myself and my family and my investments well one of the the main things is to purchase from reputable vendors you know a lot of the same stores that have a physical presence also have an online presence and and you know they have that reputation 
The other aspect is you want to make sure that um, that site uses encryption. Okay. And encryption is a way to uh, scramble your personal information. It's kind of like a, the digital version of a shredder. It keeps identity thieves from being able to gain your personal information. Hmm. Now, it used to be uh, I would look at the browser and it would be instead of just HTTP, it would have an S after that for security. Yes. Is, is that still meaningful? Yes, it is. And you want to look for where it says HTTPS. Um, but they, the newer browsers, they make it easier for you and that all you really have to look for is the lock. Hmm. Um, and actually, if, if uh, Isabel, if you want to go hop over to our, uh, our slide, on the screen there, you'll see a little lock symbol in the center of the screen. And that's how you know when something is secure. Now, if it has the lock with a red X over it or there's a red pop-up, that means that the security certificate has expired and I would okay. not purchase from that vendor. Yeah, and from time to time, I even, uh, I even get a pop-up in a box that says, mm -hmm. almost shows a certificate that shows uh, this, this, this certificate for this vendor is expired. Mm -hmm. And that would be a good idea. That's not what I'm going to purchase from. Yeah, I wouldn't purchase from a vendor that doesn't take security um, that seriously. Okay. The other thing, and I think this is less and less, but I think it's good to talk about, is uh, I know uh, wireless now is a big thing. In fact, in my house, we have wireless with different computers. In fact, we have two wireless systems uh, for some reason, but you know, with my daughter and son-in-law with us right now until they get into the new house. Uh, but I know th you, it's really important to protect them from other people accessing those wireless networks uh, tell us a little bit about how you do that. Yeah, it's important to set a, a, a wireless uh, access password. Um, we generally call them uh, WPA, uh, and that's uh, wireless um, protected access. And by setting a, a password, you keep out um, individuals that you wouldn't want on your network. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people in especially housing developments, they leave it open so that their neighbors can get on and, uh, and share their internet. But it's really not a good idea in that if your neighbors or somebody driving by with an iPhone in their hand connected to your network and did something illegal or inappropriate, it would be traced back to you. So what do I do? I, you know, I got one of those standard little wireless boxes at home. How do I, how do I make sure that has a password on it? Well, if you go to our, uh, our Safe Computing uh, website on the school district page, mm -hmm. um, there's actually directions of of how to set up your computer to do this, how to okay. set up your router. Um. Okay, good information. Uh, uh, Mr. Louie and I, we were talking a little bit about social networking. Uh, and again, I'd like to have your thoughts. That's so prevalent. Uh, so many people are involved in it. And again, three generations in my house or my, you know, with my family. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to make sure that's secure? Well, there's a, there's a couple things that, um, that parents can do. Number one is keep the computer or other devices like, um, you know, iPads, iPods, in in an area of the house that's readily accessible to everyone. So you want to keep it out of their bedroom. You want to move it into more of a high-traveled area in your house. Yeah. Um, you want to be cautious how much information you put online, because you know a simple vacation plan could be an invitation to to a robbery. And uh, things get a little more interesting now because a lot of uh, cell phone cameras and even uh, higher end digital cameras have GPS chips in them. And when you take the picture, it actually embeds the GPS coordinates into that picture. Yeah, you showed me an example of that the other day and I couldn't believe it. And uh, your cell phone, you take a picture with it, you post it online and somebody can actually go to that picture and find out exactly where it was taken from. Yeah, so the, the scary part about that is if you have um, location services turned on on your, let's say your iPhone and you take a picture and you upload it to Facebook and let's say you know your child says oh, I'm excited to go to the beach you know we're going to the beach next week they didn't give out any personal information about where they live or you know they think they're being good in, in that aspect but inside that picture has the GPS coordinates to your house so yeah yeah it's something to be aware of um, something to look at now even uh, digital cameras can do the same thing yeah even still digital cameras um, it used to be the higher end uh, digital SLR cameras, but now, you know, even the higher end um, consumer cameras are are starting to geotag. And the reason why they do that, there actually is a good reason why they geotag. And that's, for instance, if you went on family vacation, um, it would you could take pictures 
you know, at different spots, and you wouldn't have to uh, you wouldn't have to worry about remembering where you took the pictures. It would be stored in the picture, and ten years from now, you could go back and look and say, "Oh, well, this is exactly where it was taken." Yeah. Um, how do I prevent that? What uh, What do I do with my phone or camera? How do you begin to okay? I, I, I want to do something about it. With most phones, uh, when you first get it out of the box and it's brand new, um, it'll ask you, when you go to use the GPS function, let's say in car navigation, it'll say, do you want to turn on location services? And, and you say, well, yeah, of course I do because I want to, you know, get GPS coordinates so I can um, find out how to get to a particular restaurant. But from then on, it's turned on. So then when you take pictures with it, it records the, the GPS mm -hmm. coordinates. So you want to turn it on and off selectively. Go to settings typically on your mm -hmm. phone. Uh, camera, I'd have no idea, but I guess if you pull out the instructions, which is something I hesitate <laughs> to do usually, you can find that. That's correct. Okay, very good. Give us a summary. Uh, again, if you'd say, okay, here are a few very important points I want our folks at home to take home of how you can prevent these kind of threats from happening. Yeah, I would say um, number one is the easiest, and that's avoid online sweepstakes and um, uh, surveys. Uh, number two would be uh, be cautious how much information you post online and think of ways that people could use that information. Um, three would be uh, parents should friend their children and um, use, use that Facebook friendship to keep an eye on what they're doing online and choose who they're friends with online as well as offline. Okay, good advice. Yep, and the last is to keep your computer in a high use area. That's that's another one of those easy, um, easy steps that you can take that's highly effective. Yeah, and I think when you say computers now, it includes the iPods and the telephones and all those kind of things. Yeah, and now at this point it includes TVs, it includes true. Playstations, Xboxes. Yeah, true. A, a parent could think, I have the, you know, the computer's being used in the living room, the phone I don't let them use in their bedroom but they got one of those gaming systems in their bedroom that may very well have access to the internet mm -hmm. and everything else, very interesting. Yes, and a lot of them have wireless internet, so they don't need to plug in anything, uh, you know, if you have a home uh, Wi-Fi. Hmm. So I'm sure kids, you know, are savvy enough to hook it up to your home Wi-Fi. Yeah, well, if you're like me, you're scared to death now. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it is amazing, uh, the potential uh, use, but our purpose today was to try to give you some introduction on things that you can do to safeguard your computer, uh, to protect your assets, uh, but also uh, to make sure that citizenship is being used appropriately uh, on the computer, uh, and then to try to give you some hints on to avoid some threats that could happen to you uh, with your use of the computer also. So I hope it was beneficial, again, uh, to get this information and some additional uh, supplemental information, you can go to uh, our website, the Southern York County School District website at www.sycsd.org and uh, go to the quick link, uh, Safe Computing, and you'll see lots of information. I think what you'll find is we also have some links there that will take you to some free sites uh, that will further your knowledge and also uh, some sites that have uh, some, so, for example, some spyware and uh, other things free of charge that you can download uh, into your computer that uh, that'll give you some of the, uh, the safety net that we've talked about today. So, Mr. Rill, thank you very much again. Uh, appreciate all you do for our school district. Sure, thank you for and, having uh, me. Thank you. Uh, I hope you had a good time on today's Warrior Chat as we talked about safe computing. So, for Mr. Tim Hare, who's our video production teacher here at Susquehannock High School and his students who are absolutely outstanding for producing the programming that you see here on Warrior TV. For Isabel, who's back in our studio pushing all the right buttons today. Thank you, Isabel. For Mr. Mark Rill, who is our coordinator of public information, marketing and public information. For Mr. Ben Louie, uh, Mr. Bruce Mickey, who are part of this program. I'm Wayne McCullough saying, I'll see you next time.